Let's stand together. We'll sing Build My Life.
seated. Good morning. My name is Sean Crane. If you don't know me, I'm the worship pastor here at Center Fort Baptist Church. It's great to have you in our service today. If you're our guest, we want you to know you are an answer to our prayers, and uh, we hope that we will be an answer to your prayers today. Uh, it's Mother's Day, and we're so glad to be able to uh, celebrate uh, our Lord. Okay, we're here to celebrate our Lord as we honor our moms, and uh, that's, we, don't, we don't worship our moms, we don't worship our dads, but it is clear in the command of God's word that we honor our parents and that we uh, respect them and that we thank them and that we uh, take care of them and do all those things. Those are, are godly things to do and great things to do, and this morning we're going to honor our moms here in just a moment. Uh, but we want here to uh, just worship our God today. And we're so thankful if you're our guest that you've chosen to do that with us today. If you haven't done so, please stop by the Connect Desk. Uh, there's a gift there for you. If you've never been here before, if it's your first time, uh, be sure to stop by there. They've got a little little gift packet. And uh, please register as our guest. That way we know you're here. Um, there's a lot of people. It's, like it's easy to, to miss. We want to make sure that we uh, capture the fact that you were here. And uh, we won't drive you crazy just in the thank you note or or whatever a little text and say hey thanks for coming and if you have questions or anything we can answer them for you and that's uh, that's great you can do that there's a QR code in the bulletin there's one on the pewback card in front of you uh, you can fill out that pewback card if you want do it with old, old style with pencil and paper and that works just fine either way just be sure you stop by the connect desk uh, and they can help you do all that stuff um, this week, Lake Hamilton Schools will once again be using our multi-purpose building on May 14th and May 15th for a AP testing. It's all set up over there. And um, so uh, please check with the church office on those days before going into the multi-purpose building to make sure they're not currently testing. They don't test all day, but um, just make sure they're not in the middle of a test. Uh, we don't want to interrupt that. It causes all kinds of issues for them, so we don't want to do that. Uh, and today is Mother's Day, so we're not going to have rehearsal today. So choir and orchestra, you get the day off. Woohoo! get to spend time with your families. That's great. And uh, back with our guests, uh, we have Connect Lunch on May 19th. And that is for you. So if you are a guest, it's also for our church family. You know, you guys come on. Uh, it's just a chance for you to learn about our church. It is the membership process. Uh, if you want to become a member of our church, uh, it's the first step in that process is to come to the Connect Lunch. It just gives answers to just general basic questions about our faith and about our church. Uh, so it gives you information. And it's a free lunch. So, yeah, you just, just come on for that. It's great. All right, that's all the announcements I have this morning. Brother Scott, you know of anything else? Okay. Uh, we're going to get on with our, our Mother's Day stuff. We're going to start with a video. Uh, love this video. And, uh, and, and by, by God's grace, we have great screens. We'll actually be able to see the video this time. This is great. And as soon as that's done, Miss Doris, I'm going to hand you this mic and you can come do, do the uh, recognition stuff. So here we go. Mom, where are your keys? Uh, check in my purse. Hmm. She says I'm messy. Goodness gracious, go and clean out this purse. Why is there so much junk in here? Here, give it to me. Oh, what in the world? Hey, does my special mustards. Uh, my turn. Oh. These help dad with the menu. Oh, I need some of that. <gasps> Ooh, I want candy. No, not candy. These are for Cammy from when she has her coughing episodes. Hey girls, why do you need my purse? Keep moving. Okay, Slowpoke. You're the Slowpoke. Careful, that's Mom's prayer book. It hits the spot. And this is gonna take all day. It's just her purse, it's not like it's her closet. It's like a bottomless pit. I give up. Huh? <gasps> Fruit snacks! Everyone's chapsticks. Because sharing is gross. Ruby's earplugs. Also gross. Dad's screwdriver. Does she even know how to use that? I think you forgot to use this one. <laughs> For dad's ass, it's free flop. Flash card. Duct tape. Wallet. Thank you. She's broke. Does she even own keys? How could you when a purse is with everything that takes care of everyone else? Okay, Mom. I see you. Found them. Should we put all this stuff back? Nah, Mom will do it. <laughs> 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 
Sunshine Circle wants to recognize our mothers again this year. Um, I want to say have a happy Heavenly Mother's Day to my mother for 27 years and my mother-in-law, six, I believe what it is. Anyway, we're going to start with the oldest mother. Is anybody 95? 94? 93, 92, I'll bring it to you, I can stagger over here, happy Mother's Day, Thank you. I, I thought I'd bring it to you. And for our youngest mother, we're going to start at 25. Anybody 25? I hope we don't have to go forever today. 26. 27. 28. 29. 30. I started to say, who is that? I don't know who that is. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. It is great to be able to uh, celebrate and uh, together and to, uh, to honor our moms. And uh, there's so many different ways. We wish we could give every mom here. And even those who, uh, and, I, and I, I try to say this every year, there are a lot of people that are moms out there that never had kids. You know that? A whole lot of people that, who just stepped in when maybe there wasn't a mom that could or when maybe your mom just wasn't able to be there because she had to work or do all kinds of things. And there's a lot of people who stepped in. And so we, we just, we th we're thankful for you too because you may be one of those people and we're so thankful that God brought you into our lives. I know I am blessed. Uh, to have a great mom and I am uh, so thankful that God has brought her into my life and others that have been moms to me through the moms to me through the years uh, spiritual moms and, uh, and and otherwise just being there for me and uh, God is good he takes good care of us Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 11 says before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will, they exist and were created. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are this magnificent, amazing, wonderful, completely other, holy God, never created, always existing. And you are so far beyond anything we can think anything we can imagine and yet you in your holiness you in your majesty you in your wonderful magnificence are so filled with grace and mercy and love that you reached out to poor sinners like us 
And through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have drawn us to yourselves that we might stand in your presence without shame and without fear. You are our God. And we want to praise you today and lift your name and give you glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. To yield and his life and atonement for sin. great and wonderful things and so we need to give him the glory we need to give him the honor and we need to make sure that in our lives Christ is magnified
songs are so simple and yet they have such profound meaning and such is this one we've sang it for years and just simply says I have decided to follow Jesus let's sing it together no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'll be reading from that text as well as two other texts, but we'll begin in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I don't always preach uh, to mothers on Mother's Day. Sometimes I preach to women in general. Sometimes I'm in a series, but today it's going to be a Mother's Day sermon. Um, so moms, I want you to imagine today that your days are spent. And the Lord has called you into his presence and glory. So just give that a thought for a minute. Say, well, Brother Scott, that's not a very promising way to start the service. You do understand everyone here in the sound of my voice and online, that is what's going to happen unless Jesus returns. So better to think about that prospect now than to wait until it happens. I want you to imagine, ladies, those left behind you in the wake of your life will be working through all the details. Hopefully many of those you took care of before you left, but working through all those details. A church family will be praying and calling the family, maybe bringing food by. 
sending cards. A preacher will try to organize your service uh, with your family and talk about the funeral service and a eulogy and the scriptures and all of those details. Maybe even some of your friends and family will be asked or volunteer to speak on your behalf about who you were and how you lived. And they'll do their best to summarize your life with words. The word epitaph literally means over the tomb. It means to be standing over death and summarizing a life with words. So moms, today I would encourage you, leave behind an example worth imitating and with God's help, write your own epitaph. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read the first, first 18 verses and we'll dig into the story of Hannah just briefly before we move on to the next passage. 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man in uh, Ramathiam Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now, he's an Ephraimite because that's where he's living, but he's actually, when you look at First Chronicles, a Levite. So this dude is a priest, and he's living uh, there in the people of Ephraim. And he had two wives. Makes sense, because this is right out of the period of the book of Judges. And in Judges, we know that everyone just did whatever was right in their own eyes. And obviously, at least in this part of his life, he did what was right in his own eyes and decided he needed two wives. The name, the one was Hannah, and the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Have we seen this be a problem before we get to 1 Samuel? Huh. And you think your dysfunction junction is all unique to you. It's not. <laughs> this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. By the way, the first time that phrase is ever used to describe God in the Bible, right here in this story. And the two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. We'll pick them up later, and that's a different sermon, maybe for Father's Day. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely, to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord. That is, when Elkanah went up three times of the year to worship at Pentecost and Passover. In the Feast of Tabernacles, the three times they were, uh, men were required, he would bring his whole family. Hannah would go. It says she would go too. And, and therefore, before the Lord... As they're supposed to be eating and feasting, she wept and did not eat. And then, I love this, verse 8. <laughs> Fellas, we've been there. <laughs> right? <laughs> there's weeping and there's bitterness and distress and it's real and it's hard and it's painful. And so we ask questions. Because we think our questions will el elucidate the matter and make it all better. <laughs> Hannah, why do you weep? <laughs> Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Why, why, why? <laughs> and then this one, this is a great one. Am I not better to you than ten sons? Well, obviously not, dude. <laughs> of course, my response if I were Hannah, <laughs> she's nicer than I, I would have said, mm, you got two wives. Man, I, you lost all right to say anything to me about this. <laughs> Uh, but he, he's genuinely concerned about her. He wants to know why she is so broken and disappointed and heartbroken while she's supposed to be having a festival and a feast time before the Lord. This is supposed to be happy times, joyful times. So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord and she was in bitterness of soul. What'd she do? She prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. I want you to see this, mothers. She's doing both. It is a good thing when you are weeping and broken and hard things are happening to pour it out to the Lord. 
Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. What a vow. Even a Nazarite vow. And no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. So Eli was watching this woman pray near the temple and Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. There, therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So I just want to stop and just make a, a, a connection here. Things were so bad in Israel that Eli thought a worshiper was near Shiloh where they're supposed to be worshiping and just assumed she's drunk. That's how bad things were at the door of the house of the Lord in those days. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Another picture of prayer. Do not consider your, man, your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Let's pray. Father, we ask you as we have our, our Bibles opened that you would, with your Holy Spirit, help us to understand, help us to rejoice, help us to repent, help us, Lord, to find life and truth and help and uh, we just pray that you would use your words to encourage uh, the mothers uh, here today and online as, as we go through these passages together with them in mind. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. So if you're going to write your epitaph, I've got six words. Really simple. The first one, the first two words, she prayed. We have a great example in, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, where you see Hannah praying. And ladies, you need to pray when you are facing difficult or hard circumstances. She was married to a priest, Elkanah. They lived in Ephraim. And this Levite decided he needed two wives. And she was in a difficult circumstance because she was barren. That may have been the reason he took a second wife. We don't know. We can only uh, suppose that, but in verse 2 and verses 5 and 6, the Lord had closed her womb. The Lord was not allowing her to have children. You say, well, that's an Old Testament. That's a, that's a pre-scientific way of understanding. No, no, no. The Lord is sovereign over life, and he closed her womb. That is exactly what this story tells us. That's what Abraham and Sarah discovered, right? Right? And so the Lord had closed her womb. She was barren. And because of this barrenness, in verses 6 and 7, she is being mistreated by her rival. So Penina, who's there in the home and has all of these kids, and they and just imagine going up as an entourage to worship three times of the year before the Lord. And here's Penina, and Penina comes with another child every year. We've got all these children, and, and there's Hannah. And all she has is Elkanah. <laughs> So she was mistreated by her rival and she was in severe emotional distress over this. Her rival provoked her and, and, and provoked her so much in verse 7 that she wept and did not eat. Now what is interesting is that she doesn't blame the Lord in all of this. When you read the text, it appears that her trouble is her rival. Okay, so she pours out her complaint. So the first thing we notice about her, she prayed when she was in difficult situations. She was also praying when she was living in difficult times. When you look in your Bible in 1 Samuel, if you just back up one book, you have the book of Ruth, which is one of the few highlights in this period of the Judges. And you back up just a few more pages, you're in the book of the Judges. Beginning of 1 Samuel overlaps with the end of the period of the Judges. This was a dark, rebellious period of history in Israel. It, the, the people were sinful, rebellious, and I mean with a capital S and repeatedly. You may think that we have reached the pinnacle of, of what sin could be. And you may think that we're living in hard, difficult times today, but trust me, H uh, Hannah was living in the middle of very dark, difficult days. All of those judges, even the good ones, were not very good. 
And when you come to 1 Samuel, it is so bad that Eli, the priest, the high priest, has two sexually immoral sons who are perverting the law, committing sexual immorality at the house of the Lord, and encouraging the people to do it. Now just think about that for a second. That's dark. That's rebellious. That's apostasy. And listen to me. This is important. Apart from Christ, that is the norm for human behavior and the human heart. You were born with a bent away from God. It's like when we read the Bible, we go, I can't believe it was that bad. No, it's still that bad. <laughs> Most people walk that direction, go that way. But there's stories like Ruth, stories like Deborah, there's stories like Hannah in the midst of all of that darkness who shines the light of Yahweh and the light of the Lord in the middle of all of that darkness and corruption. And she was living in difficult times and she was praying. I mean, when you think about her, and, and the reason I'm making such a, an emphasis on the prayer life of, of, of Hannah is that, number one, it's very rare in the Bible to hear the words of a prayer of a woman written. It's not very often. It's just a reality. Chapter 2, <laughs> look at chapter 2. Verses 1 through 10 is, is one of her prayers recorded by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. God is trying to point out the, the, the prayer life of this woman of God as an example to follow. Now, Hannah's personal life was dysfunction junction. It's what we would call it. You've got two wives for one husband. You've got internal bickering. Imagine what it would be like once Hannah starts having kids. Would there be any favoritism, you think? Well, yes, because it says Elkanah loved Hannah more than he loved his, his Penina. You think that might cause some problems in the family? Just ask Jacob. Ask Abraham. Ask David, who will come on the scene later. Yes, this is dysfunctional. This is not the way God would create a family to bring health and holiness and, and prosperity to people. This is not how God would create it. This is not what God would want. But in the middle of that dysfunction, you know what Hannah did? She prayed. She prayed. Verse 10 says, She prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish, weeping in anguish, pouring out her soul to the Lord. She prayed and made a vow to the Lord regarding a son. And, and by the way, that's not a template for you to follow. You need to be careful in your vows before the Lord. But she made a vow before the physical presence of the Lord there at the, at the tabernacle that if God would open her womb, give her a male son, he would, she would then give that child back to the Lord. And I don't, you know, you're, you're here, so, ladies, have you given your children to the Lord? And we just go, yes, we have. Like, as long as they don't move off. <laughs> I mean, how many of you ladies want your sons or daughters to follow the Lord's will and leave you? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what we're really talking about here. No, that's what we're really talking about here. She literally gave her son to Eli who, by the way, didn't have a great track record as a father. <laughs> wow. What an example of a mom. Verse 12 says that she continued praying and then Eli interrupts her. And then in verse 19, we see that the Lord remembered her. He, in verse 19, the Lord remembered her. That means, in Old Testament language, that means that God heard her request and responded and granted her request. So she names her son Samuel and she spends a few years weaning the boy and then eventually presents him to the Lord and to Eli. And look at verse 27 and 28, 28 uh, or verse 26, this is good. So they bring all the offerings. Verse 26 says, Oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord. So this is many years after the boy's been born. He's been weaned and she's presenting him to Eli. Oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord. I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him therefore I also have lent him to the Lord 
As long as he lives, he shall be lent or given to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. As a response to this offering, then Hannah offers this prayer in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So she prayed before the child was conceived. She prayed all of those prayers. She made vows. She made promises. She's praying while he's being winged. She's praying and brings, brings him to, the, uh, to Eli and then prays as she's giving him away. In, verses, in chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, she comes back and she's still worshiping. But Samuel ministered before the Lord in verse 18, so he was serving with Eli. He's ministering before the Lord there at the tabernacle, even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Aww. <laughs> it was a little bitty one. <laughs> uh, Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And then the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. As we think about the example of Hannah, Mom... You need to write your own epitaph. Here's two good words. She prayed. She prayed before you were born. She prayed after you were born. She prayed when she gave you away. She prayed. She prayed. She prayed. Only God knows all of the good things in our lives that are happening right now today are actually tied back to the faithful continual prayers of a mom. They show up in our lives as blessings and grace and we don't know where they come from or why they even show up and we don't realize that there may have been a prayer attached to that specific thing from the lips of our moms. Mothers, you can move heaven and earth with spirit-filled, God-glorifying prayers for your children. You can enter the battlefield and slay the enemy with prayers for your children. And you don't need to wait until your family gets all sorted to start doing this. You don't need to wait until your broken heart is mended to start doing this. In your brokenness and in the the pain of your life, you need to pray for your children. In dysfunction and darkness and distress, let this be your epitaph. She prayed. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. The second statement that could be a great epitaph. She taught. Second Timothy chapter two, or Second Timothy chapter one, verse five. You know, moms are required uh, just by the very nature of their. I mean, you saw the purse, right? Does that you ever feel like that, moms? Like, not just your purse, but your brain is full of all that stuff. And it's like, well, mom finally got to sit down. Well, yes, mom finally got to sit down. And she looks like she's resting. And her body may be at a standstill. (laughs) Most moms, their brain doesn't stop. Why? Because there's all that stuff in the bag floating around, right? (laughs) All those things that you're responsible for. All those people that you're responsible for, that you feel responsible for. And moms have a God-given high calling to teach children. The church needs to reclaim that. That that is not secondary. Your calling, if God allows you to be a mother, your calling, the greatest calling you can have is to teach your children. Everything else is secondary. I mean, moms teach us how to talk and eat and walk and how to tie our shoes. Uh, You know, if you're lucky, your mama can teach you how to make gravy. I mean, that's a good thing. And if she's really nice, she can teach you how to make some biscuits to go with it, right? She teach you how to batter some chicken and then how to fry it in the pan and then make gravy from the stuff that's left over in the pan. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's lots of things that moms are, resqui- are required to, to, to teach children. And there is no substitute for the instruction that mothers give us. There's just no way to get around that. There's a void in our lives if we don't have a mom doing that. Somebody else has to step into that void. So what do you teach your kids? If, if this is going to be your epitaph, what do you focus on? Because there's so many things. And our culture and society will tell you there's this list, right? And there are other things that you ought to teach your kids besides what I'm going to 
tell you here from, from the Bible, but man, these are, number one, you need to teach them how to believe and how to trust in Jesus. Well, what do you mean, preacher? Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. So he's writing this letter at the end of his ministry. This is presumably before he is going to die. He's already, he met Timothy on his second mission trip and has had a long relationship with Timothy. So he's been able to see Timothy's faith. He's been able to watch Timothy go through being a, on the field, on the mission field with him to, to becoming a pastor. He, he's watched all of that happen. And Paul, over the course of his life, saw that Timothy had a real, genuine faith or trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not just saved, he was a follower, a disciple of Jesus. Now that word genuine means it's not hypocritical. This is important. It's not just words. It's not just on Sunday. It's not just at in public, but in private, in the home, in the life, in the checkbook, in all those private places that kids see, it needs to be genuine. Well, the question is, how did Timothy get a genuine faith? Well, that's a good question. Look at what it says. This genuine faith first dwelt where? In your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Now the key to genuine faith is that word dwelled. That means to take residence in. It's the, it's the word that, that means home. It means that in Lois and in Eunice, in their heart and in their life, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ came in and built a home. Jesus built a home there. Literally took up dwelling and residence. This same word dwelt is the same word that is used in Romans chapter 8 verse 9 to describe the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer. Now just think about that for a second. We want a genuine faith that dwells, that lives, that is rooted in us. And Timothy got that not from the Apostle Paul. He got that from his grandmother and he got that from his mother. So let me ask you a question, ladies. Are you teaching them to believe in Jesus? I'm not talking about teaching them to believe in this fairy tale Jesus that's not in the Bible, the in case of emergency break glass Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus, the living Lord, the holy, holy, holy Savior of the world. Are you teaching them by your genuine faith? To believe and trust in Jesus. Yeah, I'm not asking if you're bringing them to church so they can hear me talk for 45 minutes. I'm not asking you if, if, if you're getting them to Sunday school. And that's important too. I'm asking, is, the genuine, is your faith genuine? And is it transferable to the kids around you? Living genuine faith that dwells in a person is powerful, life transforming, and transferable. In the words of one, one, one phrase, it's the kind of thing that's caught, not taught. What does that mean? You can't really get away with it long term with kids. I mean, they're up in our business. Sometimes so much so like you have to lock the door, mom. Right? You been there? I'm going to lock the door. You kids are staying on the other side of this door. I would just like three minutes <laughs> uh, privacy <laughs> right <laughs> you know what I'm talking about we need to teach them you need to teach them to believe in Jesus you also need to teach them the Bible and notice I, I said teach I didn't say teach them to believe the Bible I said teach them the Bible look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 when you come down to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 look at the first words of verse 14 but, meaning we're contrasting something that's just been said, you must continue. That is, Timothy, you must continue. Now, what he's talking about is that when, when he looks at 
uh, this example that has been set by Paul, he tells them that everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, and evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, apostasy, lying, and deception is the norm. And Timothy, you must continue. You must continue in everything I've taught you. You must continue in this word that God has given us. You must continue. You can't take a detour. You can't twist it. Not the gospel, not the word of God. Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And the whom in verse 14 is not a reference to his grandmother and his mother, but to Paul. It's singular and it's masculine in the original language. And if you look back at verse 10 and 11, Paul gives an example of some of that. He says, you've ca carefully followed my doctrine, what I've taught you, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So he, he's telling Timothy, you, you've got to continue in everything that you have learned and been convinced of. And then notice verse 15. I want you to see this. And that from childhood, you have what? You have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, this word childhood is not referencing his adolescent years. It is not referencing his 20s. This, this has nothing to do with the time that Paul spent with him. It's actually the word for newborn infant. In fact, it's even used whenever... Uh, Whenever Elizabeth and Mary meet and the babe leaps in the womb of Elizabeth at the coming of Jesus, remember, they're both in utero. Same word, brephos. This is a baby. This is a newborn. And he says, Timothy, from your birth and before it, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Not heard them, not been told to believe them, not been told, no, you've been taught and have come to know the Holy Scriptures. Moms, you get the greatest opportunity that no preacher will ever get, that no Sunday school teacher will ever get. You are given a child to teach them the Bible, the Scriptures. Not handing it off, but embracing it. Timothy was taught by his mother and grandmother not just to believe the Bible, but to actually learn how to obey and understand it, to apply it. And the interesting thing about that is it's true for preachers, it's true for any of us. We'll get to dads later. Uh, you can't teach what you don't know. It's not the church's job to do the mother's job. It's the church's job to support, equip, and edify the moms so they can do what they have been called to do in the home you get that out of order we have kids missing out on the greatest opportunity ever which is when moms teach them the Bible now notice how both of these goals teaching them to believe in Jesus and teaching them the Bible all work together notice in verse 15 he says you have known the holy scriptures which are able that's it. there's power available in the scriptures to do something and it makes you wise not a smart aleck, but it makes you wise. For what? For what end? For salvation. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. If you teach your children the Bible, and you understand the Bible and what it teaches, that teaching will lead them to Jesus. That's the great meta narrative of the Bible. You uncover and unveil the will of God and the word of God and the character of God and man's sin and you teach them the Bible, it will lead them to believing and trusting in Jesus or at least lead them to a choice about that. Now, I want to I wanna help you out, moms, even a little bit more this morning. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. You are not responsible for the faith and repentance of your child they are you cannot force them to believe and follow Jesus you cannot force them or make them but here's the thing 
You can teach the Bible in such a way so that they know exactly what the decision is in front of them. You can live the Bible in such a way and follow Jesus and have faith in him in a genuine way that they know who he is, they know what it's all about, they know what it means to be a genuine, authentic Christian because they have seen it in three dimensions for 18 years. And while they may walk away and rebel against it, that choice is not on you. That choice is on them. So I know, I know the pain that moms feel towards wayward children or children that are out of the will of God or away from the Lord. I know. I know that it hurts. And I'm not going to say that that's <laughs> going to get better this side of heaven. But make sure that when you're feeling that sorrow that you're not taking on a guilt and a pain that God hasn't asked you to. You can weep over them, but, but please understand you can't make them choose to believe and to repent. But you can choose this for your epitaph. She taught. Third, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Together, you can back up just a few books. Interestingly enough, the church at Ephesus was, most people believe, pastored, uh, not most people believe, the, were taught that Timothy actually pastored this church. Timothy writes to it. In Ephesians 4, 29, we have the final of the six words that I think make a great epitaph for any mother. The final two words are she encouraged. Look at verses 29 through 32. Now, let's look at it in the negative light, and then we're going to cast it in the positive light because Paul does both. He says, let no corrupt word come out of your... Okay, so, I'm, okay, I'm, this, is, this is the street version, okay? <laughs> let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. Oof. Mm. Oof. Okay? But what is good for necessary edification? that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, I'm not going to go on into verses 30 through 32, but I just want you to look at, the, at verse 30, how important this is to God. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the words you and I speak to one another and about one another have the power to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is important. And moms, you know Proverbs. In the power of the tongue, in the tongue there is the power of life and death. Some of you who were not raised by moms who taught and believed and practiced this, unfortunately for some of you, You've had to retune and retrain your thinking because their voice of all those corrupt words comes up in your head. You're nothing. You're stupid. There's no hope for you. I'm so disgusted by you. Whatever those words were, those kinds of corrupt, corrosive words that destroy, that come up in your head and you're reminded of those kinds of things. There's power in the words of a mother over her children. And so what Paul is telling us is that we need to make sure in how we speak to our children and about our children. And he describes the kinds of words. Now these words in verse 29, please listen to me. This is in context and I, I don't have time to preach the whole book to get here. I mean, I do. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, we're just having Mother's Day lunch and whatnot. I'm sure mom wouldn't mind if we stuck around for four hours, but... The context of this is in chapter 4 when he comes to verse 17 and he talks about the new birth. And he talks about the fact that our words are supposed to reflect this new birth that has happened. So like the stuff coming out of my mouth that I blah on other people is supposed to reflect the new birth. I have been saved. I have a new mind. I have the capacity to turn away from my fleshly nature and sinful nature and to follow the Spirit's lead so I just like to tell the truth. No, you're just mean. You're just unkind. <laughs> Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. It's like, Brother Scott, does that mean like 
yeah, I, I probably need to reword some sermons. I got to be careful with the words I use in sermons and how I say them and why I say them. What's motivating those words? I don't want the words of God to be twisted by me and then turn out to be corruptive, corrosive words on you. And mothers have an opportunity to encourage children with their words. Look at this, look at the, the, phrase, the phrases that are used to describe the kind of words you can use, mom. Number one, good words. Good words. Words filled with scripture, words filled with holiness, words filled with hope, good words. Holy words. And I'm not talking about being super spiritual and having to quote a scripture every time you talk to your kids. I'm not talking about that. I don't think Paul is either. But he's talking about good, helpful words. And then he says, encourage them with necessary words. Now, mom, this is important. <laughs> you see your kids, right? And you look at them as a mom and you go, huh? They got some issues. Have you ever had that conversation with yourself? You say, oh Lord, I didn't know when I had this child I was going to be dealing with this situation. And then you're, you want to try to help, right? Because you're mom. And you're called to. And this is what he's talking about. Like there is something that is lacking in your child that needs a good word from the Lord and from his word to teach and to train. So don't make stuff up. Make sure it's necessary. <laughs> make sure there's, it's filling a need in their life. And this is important. Make sure it's filling a need in their life and not a need in yours. Because this is one of the biggest mistakes we make as parents where we try to live retroactively uh, through our children. We're going to go back and get it right because our lives were such and such and we're going to, we're going to, no, no, no. You need to look at the child and look at their needs. What's necessary for their growth? What words do you need to speak over them and speak to them and teach them? What words do you need to be saying for that particular child at that particular time? They're necessary words. And, and please understand, when we talk about encouraging words, we're not talking about being, uh, you know, just being nice all the time. What a blessing. <laughs> because if you go back in chapter 4 verse 15 one of the signs of maturity is the ability of a mom to speak the truth in what? love sometimes our kids need to hear truth mom and if you don't tell them the truth in love you're actually hating them there are some necessary words that have to be said to kids. Why? Because all of us, if we remember our upbringing and even as an adult, when we needed an adult to come alongside us who loved us and said, we got to talk. I need to give you some good words. And here's some necessary words. And look at what the necessary words do. Thirdly, it says, uh, encourage them with edifying words. That word edify, we don't use it a lot, but it means to build up. And, and for a person, it's talking about uh, you know, for a building, it's talking about building up good foundation, building up a good structure. For a person, it's talking about whatever is necessary that is, will fill out what is lacking. What do, my, what do my children need to grow to maturity? What words do they need from me as I try to help them become all that God has called them to be? And by the way, that's a, that's a pretty good blueprint for just personal discipleship, isn't it? Like you're not going to get there without the good word of God. You're not going to get to Christ-like maturity without the Word of God. Because we got, we got issues, all of us. And God's Word has answers. And He builds us up through that Word. And mom, you get to share that with your kids. You get to encourage them with good and necessary words. Now look at the power. We talked about the, the power of death, but look, at the, 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 the tongue has the power of life. Look at verse 29. He says... Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. Here's the whole purpose, that it may impart. Well, I don't want them to have grace. I want them to feel as guilty as I did when I was a kid. <laughs> now, if they've sinned and you're pointing it out, you can let the Holy Spirit sort that out, right? But sometimes it's, it, I mean, and you, you've had those teachers 
Those coaches who made it unusually hard on you because it was unusually hard for them for no good reason. And so everybody has to I suffered. I suffered, so you're going to suffer. I don't care if it's completely irrational. I'm going to make you hurt. <laughs> Why? Because well, it was hard. And I want you to, you know, appreciate that. No, no, no. Our words are supposed to impart grace. The grace of God mediated to the words of a mother. Now think about the power of that for a second. That you as a mom can fill your home with the word and the grace of God by how you speak to and about your kids. They can begin to taste and see that the Lord is good because they taste and see the grace that is coming from you to them. What an opportunity. What a privilege. Mothers, your words matter. Let the life-giving truth of God come across your lips. And, and let me give you a practical, maybe some practical help. And if it's not any good for you, then just discard it from a preacher who's a man and not a mother. <clears throat> Part of the problem is that when we are talking to our kids, sometimes the only conversations we have with them as moms, as mothers, I say we, that you have as mothers, because I'm not a mother, I'm trying to keep that straight. Um, Got to make that clear these days. <laughs> is that a lot of times these conversations only come up when the wheels have come off, right? And there's a crisis. Something bad has happened and we have to give corrective discipline, right? And we need to give corrective discipline. I need corrective discipline from the Lord. I needed corrective discipline from my mom growing up, right? But if that's the only time you ever give your children the good words of God, they're going to miss out on all the edification and all of the grace. They're going to miss out on some of that. You, you need to step back and think about formative discipline, which is really, that happens every day all the time. You get up in the morning, you're getting ready for breakfast. You're walking out the door, you're getting in the car, you're taking them places. Formative discipline happens as a, just a manner of life. And that part of our life is supposed to be filled with the good, necessary, edifying, gracious words of God. And when necessary, then move over into the corrective side. But fill up, and I know this is crazy talk, fill up your van while you're sitting in line <laughs> at Lake Hamilton schools to drop off your kids. Because <laughs> I, I can imagine what that van's probably like some days. Stop it! <laughs> Put on your shoes. <laughs> Stop throwing the, <laughs> the, the Pop-Tart at your sister. <laughs> right? <laughs> this, is, this is where you're teaching and training and equipping and encouraging apart from all of the events or problems of life. This can become your epitaph. She encouraged. Mothers, write your own epitaph by leaving an example behind worth following. Six simple words. I think are a good start to a good epitaph. She prayed, she taught, she encouraged. Now, I want to give you my testimony as I think about these ideas. I have the blessing of two moms in my life. My mother, Susan Bates, and my mother-in-law, Betty Davis. And I am thankful for them both. They are mothers to me. In fact, as I think about all the, the, the scriptures and even the writing of this sermon, they were both on my mind as I wrote this sermon for you. That the gift, these two ladies, gifts of the grace of God in my life. One that God gave me at birth and another that God gave me because she was attached to Esther. Praise the Lord. So happy, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Betty. So the application, let me give you four. Number one, I wrote a sermon. You can write a card. You can sit down and lock eyes with your mama or some other way of communication and give her honor for who she is and the difference she has made in your life. Secondly, if your mo mother is no longer here as we close this service together, you can use our closing to thank God for the gift of God's grace in your life for the mother he gave you. This can, this can be a time to think back on all of those gifts 
And I'm also thinking about the people in this room and online who, who, who didn't, have the kinds, didn't have the kind of mother that I had growing up or, or now my mother-in-law. And, and, and this sermon has made you mad or sad because God didn't give you these gifts so much. And you've had to relearn or learn how to be. A, well, let me, let, me, let me encourage you. You have the opportunity to be someone else different and you can't keep living in the past of what you didn't have and neglect what you ought to be giving to your children you have the power to change the entire trajectory of everyone who follows in your footsteps imagine the difference you can make in the generations that follow if you become the woman that your mother never was think about Hannah she prayed she worshipped she was faithful and as a result God gave her Samuel now where would we be without Samuel in the Bible hmm. fourth application be this kind of mother to other people in this church we need church mothers and grandmothers say well uh, I, no, I, I always hear this one my time is done <laughs> now wait, wait, wait a minute you spend all of this time learning how to be a mom and a grandma and how to, how to teach and how to train and how to love Jesus do you think God intends you after your kids are older to just go okay that's, I'm done now no there are people in this church who need to be mothered by you no, oh, they don't want to listen to me. No, they do. I promise you. If we do what these epitaphs said, the church needs mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and even great-great-grandmothers like this kind of woman. Mothers, write your own epitaph by leaving an example behind worth following. Here are six simple words. She prayed, she taught. She encouraged. Why don't you stand with us as we have a time of invitation. Oh, uh-huh.